hearing about the series for a very long time. And very good thing. Um, so my book is called The Suicide of Claire Bishop. It's a uh, two-voice narrative. Um, it's about a woman named Claire who's sitting for her portrait in 1959, but instead the artist paints an image of her suicide, and that haunts her, and we follow her in the painting 10, 20, 30 years in the future. The alternating narrative is uh, from the point of view of a man with schizophrenia named West, and he finds that painting in an art gallery in present day and creates a delusion around it involving time travel and Hasidism and other fun things. Uh, so I'm going to read just a couple minutes from both voices. Oh, and on the way here, I, I rode with Jinan and Jan, who are both uh, going to read tonight, and um, we hadn't met before, but we started talking about all the ways that we might die, because that's what authors do. Um, and so I'm going to read a, a piece that's appropriate to that. And one of the characters in my book says, you can't ever be bored because there's so many ways you could imagine dying. So, <laughs> so this is from Claire's point of view in 1959. On the roof, she could see her breath. It led her to the edge. She stumbled over the big bubbles of tar roofing, rising like waves. Claire bent low and leaned her hands on the cement ledge. Tipsy still, it was possible she could fall from the ledge and land on her cobblestone street, just like in the painting. Was there courage in falling? Was that what Nicolette had seen in her? Nicolette is the artist. Claire pushed herself away from the ledge as if pushing away the thought and stood erect. It was a childish notion, foolish. Did she take pride in her own misery? She certainly did not want to die. If she felt otherwise, it was only pretending. She loved tromping around town with Mary. She loved her martinis, her view, her street. It was such a nice street, wasn't it? She wouldn't want to ruin it, and it would be terribly gosh to have people see her body splattered over the cobblestone. All those people who would stop to whisper and point long after she was scraped away, saying proudly because they were in the know, remember how that simple woman jumped? Claire hated those whispering, hissing women gaping over her remembered body. She hated them. She leaned over the ledge and spit wide, spitting on those women. She could give a damn what they thought. It was her choice. If she wanted to fall, she would fall. At any rate, she knew she would be the best at it. You could always be the best at something, even if it was at falling, falling fastest, falling farthest. Freddie was asleep by the time she entered the bedroom, the cold still on her. There was a brandy-induced sway to the darkness. With small movements, she climbed into the bed beside her husband, careful not to disturb him. She watched closely to see that his chest rose and fell. He was alive. In the dark, looking to the ceiling, she made a face like she had just been told Freddie had died. She flattened out her expression, then molded it again, the devastating news rushing over her features, crinkling her brow, an open frown, but not too quickly, or it would seem she'd been expecting it. Often when Freddie left the house, Claire imagined a phone call from his sister or the hospital, some horrible accident, carelessness on the verge of suicide. She would say it was her fault for the sake of the family. She saw herself mourning in a tailored dress of black lace at the edge of his grave, wearing that face, and she tried to gauge what she was thinking based on that expression alone. When she found herself imagining the details of Freddie's death, it came in a headline reel at the cinema, adulterous husband <coughs> struck by fluke airplane crash on Riverside. She was ashamed of these thoughts, but she told herself it was fear that compelled her to fantasize over his death. If she articulated a given scenario, it would not happen, it could not happen, she was protecting him. That was the magical thinking Nicolette had said she used with the notion of Claire's suicide. She painted it out of being. So I'm going to skip ahead and read just a little bit from West's point of view. So his ex-girlfriend is named Nicolette. So the same name as the artist in 1959. And this is, takes place in 2004. Everyone has an origin story, everyone but Nicolette. 
I don't know where she came from. I don't even know how old she is, but when I met her, she was 26 and acted as if she'd lived a century. She was wise enough. I think she let herself fall in love with me because she knew how I was, and maybe she felt she owed something to the world. She wanted to save me. Cheers to that ill-conceived good intention. But all I added to her life was trouble. When I'm interviewed for her biography someday, I will color it with idiosyncrasies like, and then she fell in love with the boy who went schizo on her. I loved her so much, I could rip out my collarbone. When I get to my Chinatown apartment, it's thick into dusk and I have mail. I take my little stack of bills and reminders of bills from the entranceway mailbox and sit out on the stoop. The day is a deflated balloon, New York in summer, shriveled and sexual. I feel scattered. The street gives off its street smell, three parts fortune cookie from the factory next to my apartment, one part leather soles, ten parts piss. The Bowery is breaking down. All the shops selling restaurant supplies and lighting fixtures. I'm worried they aren't long for this world. Across the street, the red neon sign flashes, psychic open, psychic open which I can see without fail from my apartment and which definitely means nothing. There's old Tachi with his remote-controlled car. The balding Chinese man is never without it. I don't know his real name, so I gave him one, Tachi. There hasn't been one night this summer when he hasn't been racing his car, holding it all together, surveying the neighborhood with his little monster truck the size of a human head. Tachi is out of sight, but his car bounds toward me down Broom Street, heading for Bowery. It sounds like it needs a tune-up. Bowery is a big street and the little truck could easily be crushed. It bounces over the cobblestone, digs into dips, and comes up soaring, louder than any real car, piercing and monotone. But the humidity drowns it out. The weight of the air is deafening. It'll rain soon. There's no way around it. A hot summer rain. Here is one truth. Someone or something is always trying to block Nicolette and me from coming together but this time I won't let them. You see that girl shaded in the front seat of that parked car? I think she's crying, her head bobbing that way. The shadows of the sidewalk tree dance on her little face in a hot breeze. No, a reflection that looks like a shadow. I'm afraid she'll be swallowed by it. If Nicolette were to place landmines around New York, they would take the shape of shadows like that, sinister, bloodless. Everything would be the inverse of itself. But not everything is a Nicolette installation, an easy thing to forget. All the overweight men stand in front of their shop fronts, hands on their belly. They look worried, and Tachi's car is still missing down Bowery. Somehow, sometimes I'm the only living man. Everything is in its place, laced and placed. Old Tachi outside searching for his car, and the vendors all talk, no sale, their coats blazing in the wind. And there are cars, but they aren't driving. No one's buying. The girl crying in the front seat of one and a kid standing by the door of another waiting for someone, but they aren't coming. Hey, I want to say to him, hey, get out of here. They ain't coming. No one's coming. No one's buying. And still no monster truck. Sometimes I feel like that, like telling everyone how it is. Their suffering is mine. And then I think of Nicolette and I'm confused because there's this little fleck of hope in the back of my throat choking me. Hope for the little kid staring at his reflection in the empty car. Hope for Tachi's truck. Hope for the cobblestone that isn't pavement yet and with any luck may never be. And I think then, I think I'll say to them, don't worry, you'll get to your plane on time. You'll get a seat on the bench when you're tired. You'll find the words to ask forgiveness. No one dies during childbirth, no cancer, no famine. You'll get another chance, there will be another. Hope that the weather is just kidding and your parents will remember you and someone will remember you and pick you up and take you home. We're all okay, it's going to be all right. It's going to be all right, all right. Thank you. Thank you.